Okay. Um, good, good morning, or I guess good whatever it is for the online crowd. So today we're going to finish looking at locke volterra equations. Um, when people say locke volterra equations, they're talking usually about predator-prey models, but there are so many variations on this system. It's extremely famous. There have been thousands of papers written on it. Um, let's look at a variation of the Locke volterra equations where instead of having a prey species and a predator species, we have two animal species in competition with each other for the same resources. So that's sort of a major characteristic of this model. Um, if there were infinitely many resources, it wouldn't make sense to talk about competition. So instead of having two species that behave differently, a predator species and a prey species, we'll have two species that behave identically. They can both be predator species, by competing for the same prey animal. They can both be prey species competing for the same plants, whatever. But let's put the equations down and let's talk about them. So this is not going to be the full equation. I'm going to write another term, but let's remind ourselves what this is. And I mean, I say remind ourselves, but we looked at this months ago. I wouldn't really expect you to have this at the, at the tip of your tongue, but this is the logistic growth model. And the reason that we're starting with the logistic growth model is that the logistic growth model encodes our assumption that there are finitely many resources. A population that's growing logistically looks like this. And the reason we have this horizontal asymptote, the reason we have this maximum value is that there are only enough resources to support finitely many animals. So the animal species grows until there aren't enough resources for it to grow further and then it stops growing. So we're going to start by assuming that both species grow logistically. But of course, what's lacking from the logistic equations is any interaction between the species. There's no competition. So let's put in a competition term uh, in both these equations. So we talked about this, I'll put in, let me put that there. We talked about this when we talked about the, the 
on Lockerville Terror Predator Prey models. When we have our variables being multiplied together, the implication is generally that the system is being drawn between our various variables interacting with each other. So in the predator-prey model, the prey species and the predator species interact, and it's good for the predator and bad for the prey. Um, in the SIR model, which we'll talk, which we talked about briefly, and which we'll come back to soon, um, susceptible people and infective people interact. And that's bad for the susceptible group and good for the infective group, if you want to think of it in those terms. So there's a product. Um, here, competition is driven by interaction. I mean, if this species never interacted with each other, then they can't be competing for the same resources. So we see this XY term to represent the fact that competition is driven by this interaction. There's a, there's a prey species that both the predator species want, and they come together and they interact, and one of them gets the prey species and the other doesn't. If you flip back through your notes, um, when we were looking at the Locke Volterra predator prey model, one of these was positive and the other was negative because interaction is good for the predator, bad for the prey. Here, this interaction is bad for both species. Um, because when there's an interaction, it means they're competing for something and they won't both get what they want. Or another way to think of it is that when they interact, there's maybe only a 50% chance that either of them will get what they want. So that's not good for anyone. And we have two negative terms. Now, I'm going to wave my hand a little through some of the less rewarding details. Um, there are four fixed points of this model, but three of them represent extinction. So there's a mutual extinction fixed point where the two species um, drive each other extinct. And then there's a fixed point where the second species drives the first species extinct. And then there's a fixed point where the first species drives the second species extinct. And then there's a mutual survival fixed point. And if we solved for the mutual survival fixed point in terms of our A's, B's, and C's, it would end up looking very ugly, very messy, let's say. So we just give it a name. We call it X sub E comma Y sub E. Both species continue to exist here. And rather than try to do stuff in generality, I'm going to look at a specific equation, a specific example, 
And I'm going to talk about the stability of each of these fixed points in that example. And then I'll make some general remarks. The x dt is 14x minus 1 half x squared minus xy. dy dt is 16y minus 1 half y squared minus xy. And the fixed points here are zero, 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 thirty-two, twenty-eight, zero, and then our coexistence fixed point twelve, comma eight. Let's find the Jacobian. So the derivative of this first equation with respect to x, 14 minus x minus y. The derivative of this first equation with respect to y, negative x. Um, the derivative of the second equation with respect to x, negative y. And the derivative of the second equation with respect to y, 16 minus y minus x. And now let's take the Jacobian and that's bug these points into it one by one, and let's see what happens. Um, oh, sorry for the radio silence. I, uh, I thought I'd uh, paused the recording so I could just scroll down the that's interesting stuff. But um, when we plug in 0, 0, here's our Jacobian, and here are our eigenvalues. Um, if you've taken linear algebra, this is a diagonal matrix, so the eigenvalues can be found without any work. If not, you take the determinant as usual. So two positive eigenvalues. This is a node. And it's unstable. Now, zero, comma, thirty two. So, once again, we have a node, we have two distinct real eigenvalues. This node is asymptotically stable. And this second fixed point, where one species has driven the other extinct, 28, 0, this is also going to be asymptotically stable. So that leaves us the, um, the fixed point of mutual coexistence 
x sub e comma y sub e. And again, I'm sort of skating over the more tedious parts of this. I mean, we would have to actually find what x sub e comma y sub e is to stick it into the Jacobian, which we did, um, but entirely off screen. Um, once again, aligning the linear algebra, we wind up with um, a positive eigenvalue and a negative eigenvalue. Um, the square root of 97 is around 10. So this is around negative 10 and um, positive five. So this is a saddle and it's unstable. And what this system is doing, if we draw a phase plane, here's a fixed point where one of the species goes extinct. Here's another fixed point where one of the species goes extinct. Here's a mutual extinction. Here's mutual survival. And you really need to use a computer to get a clear idea of what's going on. I mean, what we do know is that two of these fixed points are asymptotically stable and two of them are unstable. What's going on, what we're seeing here is trajectories like this. So that mutual existence fixed point is a saddle. So there is one direction where things are converging to the fixed point from, but every, um, every other point on this plane is going to follow these arrows and wind up at one of the single extinction fixed points. So what we're predicting here is that one of the species will drive the other species extinct. Now, this of course was something we saw in a specific example, but it's true that extinction is always unstable and it's true that these um, single extinction fixed points are always asymptotically stable. For mutual existence, how can I put this? Unstable, but it sort of depends. Let's, um, let's talk about that. So let's talk about, and I'm, go I'm going to want these equations. So I'm, let's, um, 
we're done with this example. Let's get that frame back. The stability of this fixed point, x sub e, comma, y sub e, depends on the parameters c and b. If c1 times c2 is less than b1 times b2, this fixed point is actually asymptotically stable. But let's take a look at what this equality, C1, C2, less than B1, B2, is actually saying here. So there are finite resources. And because there are finite resources, everything is competing with everyone else. All of the constants, well, not the A1 and the A2, but the Bs and the Cs are both competition terms. This B1 is the competition within species X. And this B2 term is the competition within species Y. Remember that even if species X and species Y didn't interact with each other, they wouldn't be going to infinity. Even if they didn't interact with each other, they'd be doing that. Um, there are finite resources, and the animals in species X have to compete for those finite resources, and the animals within species Y have to compete for those finite resources. I mean, if there's not enough grass for the rabbits, then some rabbits will eat, then some rabbits won't, and they're competing for that limited food. On the other hand, this C1 and this C2 represent the competition between species. So let's take a look at this equality. This C1 and this 2 represents the competition between the species. This B1 and this B2 represent competition within the species. So what C1, C2, less than B1, B2 tells you is that the competition between the species is marginal. That is to say you have, say you have hawks 
and foxes, both eating rabbits. Then these animals are or should be competing with each other, but if this inequality is being satisfied, the hawks are mostly competing with other hawks. And the foxes are mostly competing with other foxes. Now, if the reverse equality is satisfied, C1, C2 is greater than B1, B2, this means that inter-species competition is important. And when inter-species competition is important, when species are really going at it for limited resources, this fixed point becomes unstable. And what we are seeing here is a mathematical statement of the competitive exclusion principle. which is also called Gauss's law, which is often stated as follows. No two species can occupy the same ecological niche. That is to say, if there are two species that are trying to eat exactly the same food, one of them is going to drive the other extinct. Um, so this has been seen in laboratories. It's been demonstrated mathematically. Um, having said that, we would be remiss if we didn't say that the real world is complicated. And no sooner did you think you've stated some kind of general law, then you start seeing exceptions to it. The so-called paradox of the plankton is a very famous 
exception to the competitive exclusion principle. You might not think of Fenton as competing with each other, but they all need light, and there's only so much surface area to go around. So as odd as it might seem to think of light as a limited resource, um, plankton do compete with each other. But the, power, um, the competitive exclusion principle fails. And this is something that people are still studying. Like, you might think that anything that gets taught in an undergraduate differential equations class is going to be pretty well settled, and that's mostly true. But you can find very recent papers, like papers within the last few years, still trying to explain why the competitive exclusion principle occasionally fails. It's an area of active research, to, to say that in the most pompous way possible. And those are the Locke Volterra equations. I mean, as I've said, there are basically an infinite number of variations. You'll see some variations on the on the third test. Um, but for now, we will move from this section to other material.